Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor to introduce you here on this such a special day, one of the biggest reference in sound engineering. Com vocês, the microphone queen, Silvia Messi! Yeah, yes, <laughs> now! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Silvia! I, That's I, nice I, to be here. Uh, yeah. Uh, here in Brazil, uh, we are so excited about you, about this interviewing, this interview. <laughs> uh, sorry, my English. <laughs> I'm, it's okay. I, I, I don't speak English and nervous, it's worst. <laughs> But I know if we, you are doing well today. Doing well? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. Um, I want to say thanks for inviting me. It's a... Um, uh, it's not very often that I am talking with Brazil, you know, uh, so I'm very happy because I have good friends there. And uh, so I'm excited to uh, meet you and to talk about uh, uh, audio today. Yes, about audio, not how to <laughs> be one woman in audio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk <laughs> about our work, our job, about audio. That's our love. Love. Um, first, how do you manage to? Uh, first, first, but you know you are a big reference for us, right? And, and not only for girls, but for everybody. I I receive a lot of messages to to friends. Oh, Karen, uh, um, talk to her that I love her. I love their uh, oh. her job. So oh. we are very uh, excited to, to have you here. And you are known to, to your techniques, but, but you are a fucking person, <laughs> fucking great yeah. person. Yeah. And I'm a strong I, woman, <laughs> powerful. Yes. <laughs> And I want to know how did you manage to overcome all the battles to be in your position today? Well, being a, a, an engineer and a, a music producer is difficult for anybody, you know, to get in. It takes a lot of time. You have to be uh, very knowledgeable of the equipment. Um, you also have to have some kind of understanding of music to be able to communicate with the musicians and to know when the sound is, uh, you know, out of tune or... Uh, is distorted in a bad way. So these things, you, you need to understand uh, what uh, instruments are supposed to do. Uh, so, yeah, at the beginning, I was uh, 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 in a school band. I played flute. <laughs> oh, nice. And, <laughs> and I was uh, in the marching band. So I would go to high school marching um, and... From there, I started in a band where I was a singer uh, in a rock band. And, uh, and I was trying to understand how it is to record in a studio. Um, so I went to a very small studio. It was my first experience. And I really was very excited at um, how the equipment worked and how the engineer is as important as a musician when it comes to making this music and to recording the music. Um, so uh, I tried really hard to, um, to learn what I could. And then I was uh, interested also in radio because radio is where some of my favorite music was, was being played. So I was in a university radio station And I learned how to use equipment in the university radio station for making commercials. Uh, and then that I was able to take to a music studio and say, look, I know how to use this equipment. Give me a job and I, so I can do the music recording. And eventually I got, I got some starting positions and I started to learn how to, uh, or I started to work with different musicians on their music. Um, it was a natural thing for me because I grew up in a house. My mother was an opera singer, 
and my father was a mechanical engineer and he would build his own electronics. Uh -huh. So ever since I was very small, my first memory is of being in front of my father's tape recorder with a microphone. And he gave me the microphone. I'm two years old. I'm talking into the mic and listening to the my voice on the speakers. And I, this just made me so excited when I was a child. Um, it kind of uh, changed my life right there. You know, it's amazing what happens to children when you introduce these things to them at a young age. So that's that's how I found my way in. Um, I never really went to school because there were no schools when I started uh, for uh, engineering and for uh, production. So I was making it up as I went along and I learned from uh, other engineers. But uh, but yeah, it's a, it's been a long time now. I think I've been doing this for 35 years and wow. <laughs> I'm still learning. I mean, you will never stop learning because the technology is always changing and you have to keep up. Yes. You know what I mean? Oh, and uh, talking about that, uh, what do you think is the main importance of being an assistant engineer besides studying and all this stuff? Well, at one time, being an assistant engineer was an essential part of running a music studio, recording studio, because uh, the equipment was very complex and there were, and it was a lot of it. Uh, so it took two people actually to set up and run a studio. Uh, so I, I did do assisting uh, at one time. Now I think this job of assisting engineer is not so common or popular just because everybody can have their own equipment at home. So we don't need an assistant anymore. People know more about recording now than they ever did before, uh, which is a good thing. I, I am happy that more people are recording. It used to be a very exclusive club because the equipment was so expensive. But now, uh, you know, people have uh, have uh, very good recording systems at home when they're recording digitally. Uh, it's it's a lot less expensive than having an entire studio. Good, Sylvia. Um, yeah, all of us have failures. Failures, is correct? Mistakes. Está correto, Rafa? Failure. Failures. Yeah, fa failures. Uh, uh, mistakes and difficulties. difficulties. Yes, 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 yes. Failures. Yeah. Okay, yes, I understand. Yes. And yeah. um, what's your inspiration to be such a brave and strong person? <laughs> well, there's no choice, you know. <laughs> you get a, into a, a project, you start a project, you have to finish. And that's one very important thing about being a producer. A lot of people want to be a producer, but it's only the people who finish that are real producers, right? If you're working on the same song for five years <laughs> and you can't finish it, I can't know. I don't know that you're a producer. It's like uh, a producer will produce. So you have to finish what you start and you have to make a plan of uh, how to finish and maybe a time limit. Uh, and then you have to be strong with that, uh, with that, okay, this is when it ends, you know, and you have to know when it's finished. Um, these things are very difficult for a lot of people to do, but... Uh, do, do, you, do you think you have to be, to feel prepared? And how, how do you, do you uh, start that? You like, um, if you, you did, uh, you felt prepared, like, uh, now I'm going to have a studio and I'm going to produce my own stuff, or was it natural yeah. for you? Ah, oh, well, I had my own band, and so I wanted to record my band and my music. And uh, at the time, uh, this was done in very expensive studios, so I got a job, and then I would go in at night when no one was there, and I would record my own music. Uh, this worked for a little while, but I got in trouble because you're not supposed to sneak into the studio in the middle of the night. So I did get fired from a job. <laughs> For, for sneaking in, you know, to record. But uh, uh, yeah, you just, uh, uh, the, the, the idea of working on my own music was the first thing. But when I did finish some things and other, other bands would listen to our demos or whatever, 
uh, we had, uh, they said, hey, Sylvia, do something like that for, for my band too. And then I started doing other clients. Uh, so it just kind of moved naturally like this. And, and there was no guide for me because it hadn't, you know, been done. There's no school or anything for that. So I just kind of was just like, okay, I can do this. And even though this was not the idea of a, a job that I ever thought I would have, I am so happy that it happened this way. Yeah. Uh, because I, I started in art. I was a painter and I went to university for art, but I wound up going into, you know, recording instead. So uh, another so, kind of art, <laughs> another type of art. Yes, that's true. Uh, Silva, if you would be starting today, where would you start? If in, I was starting your, our, our journey, audio journey. Ah, let's see. Oh, wow. Well, so much, so much uh, water has passed under the bridge. Now I have to think of where I would begin today. And because digital music or digital recording is so easy now to get into, uh, I would start there. I would start with um, uh, the, the garage band, very easy to start writing music and recording on garage band, very simple, but you still need to have some equipment. So I would need to buy, a, a initial, uh, uh, interface for audio to digital. So that's A to D. Um, I would, get a few microphones. I would get a pair of microphones that I could trust. And those that that would be probably this microphone right here. Right. Uh, SM58. <laughs> sure. SM58. Right. I mean, this is inexpensive, you know, $100 each, maybe less. Uh, get two of them. Now I could record pretty much everything. You can record drums with that. You can record guitars, vocals, bass, anything, you know, key, uh, piano. Just uh, so really all you need is this. But the most important thing, I think, is the mic preamplifier. And it's an analog piece of equipment. And I've learned over time that you can have digital recording, but the microphones, as they come into the recorder, need to go through an analog circuit that will enhance the sound of the mic. And if you have a cheap mic pre, then you're going to have a very thin and cheap sounding recording. So I would spend the most money on mic preamplifiers. And so I have a few here. Um, and uh, let's let me take Let me show you. you know, yes. Let's see if I can get the camera to change. Can I show you a few? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, Please. I, I want to, <laughs> okay, I want, good. I want to ask you if uh, uh -huh. would you try to work as assistant too if he, uh, you were If starting? I started now? Yes. I, I don't think the jobs, there's so many jobs there now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's almost like you're on your own uh, because the big studios have a very limited staff. Oftentimes the limited staff, they want to be there forever. Very few people are starting in assistant jobs. So I would like that, but I think it would be much harder to start there. You would have to move to a place where there is uh, professional studios. They would have to be busy. Oh, COVID has been a disaster for studios in, in Los Angeles, just terrible. So uh, there's many things to, to uh, think about there, but let me show you some of these mic pre's yes. here. I've got a an extra little camera. I use these little iPhone cameras. So let me see if I can get this to go here. Hang on a second. Uh -huh. All right. And the floater. Hi. Hey, can you see me? Yes. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> okay. So let me show you. Oh, I dropped my mic. Hang on. Hold on. I dropped my microphone. Um, we have a lavalier today. Oh, yes. Oh, just now, yeah. Portuguese. Uh, Portuguese. Uh, yeah. Pessoal, eu não estou conseguindo acompanhar, tá? Eu estou muito nervosa aqui. Eu não estou conseguindo acompanhar o chat. E a gente tem um tempo curto. Então, eu estou com as minhas perguntas aqui. E acho que não vai, eu não vou conseguir ver, fazer as perguntas de vocês, tá bom? Ok. 
back. Okay. All right. So here, I'm going to flip the camera around so you can see. This is uh, this is the studio. Uh -huh. I have Rupert Neve 5088 console, uh, and it's split into two pieces. There's another piece, and then I have my computer in the middle. Over here, I have an old. Uh, uh, it's called a WEM. And that is an English live console, but I don't really use it, but it just looks good. But over <laughs> here, <laughs> it looks really I, good. <laughs> I know, right? But over here, this is this is for real. This is the, the loop trotter. And I wanted to show you this because the loop trotter console has uh, 500 series modules that just fit in there from all different makers. So uh, we have Angus EQs, we have APC EQs. Uh, we have uh, the um, uh, Phoenix Audio EQs. And and over here, there's warm audio mic pre's. Uh, there's a, a Black Lion audio mic pre. Uh, there's Loop Trotter mic pre's and Mo Mog. This blue is Mog EQs Mog. and Mog I mic pre. Now, this, this, uh, these mic pre's are really good quality mic pre's. Now, if you have like uh, this type of console, these mic pre's are excellent also, the Rupert Neve uh, designs. Mm -hmm. And then these Loop Trotter and any 500 series, you can get all kinds of really high quality mic pre's that fit into 500 series modules. So let me go back to my overhead here. Wow. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, I think, you know, if I was starting over, I would want to have some mics. I need two good mic pre's so I can do stereo. And then uh, a, a computer that I can record to uh, with software like a GarageBand. A compressor is nice too, but you can use a plug-in uh, compressor. It's good also. But, uh, but the hardware, having analog mic preamplifier very important. Now there was. But a, you're a hybrid, uh, Sylvia. You yeah. you are, you also now not starting. <laughs> uh, you also mix with plugins or yes. only hardwares. Oh oh yes, absolutely. I work with uh, digital uh, plugins. Um, I mix in the box, except for the output. I have it go through a summing mixer, analog. Okay and then back into the computer. And I'll, let me show you that too. This yes, is yes. <laughs> uh, uh, my computer system. And let me just move to this thing right here. Okay, float, all right. So under here, I think you can see that I have um, this rack of, of uh, converters and what I have is uh, 16 channels of converters. I'm sorry you can't see it very well. It's kind of dark down here. But the 16 channels of dangerous music converters goes into this, this uh, summing mixer. And a summing mixer is just uh, taking digital signal from Pro Tools and summing it down to two analog tracks, two analog uh, channels. And then those uh, analog channels go back into the computer. Uh, through these uh, A to D converters. And that basically is, is how it's laid out. But this dangerous music summing is the way that I mix now. And I find like I have a lot more headroom uh, on my mixes when I work this way with the, um, the analog summing. So I do a hybrid like that now. But, but that you... one's developed over time. But you uh, mix in the box even when you're not, uh, you, you didn't record it, the, 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 or, or everything. Yeah, I think depending on the, the files, if I don't record it and it comes and I listen and I think, oh boy, this is, everything was recorded digitally. You can hear when something has not been recorded analog. You know, analog has a little more warmth and thickness. So uh, what I will do is if someone sends me files and I start mixing, I might send some of these. Hey, <laughs> hey, come here. Where are you? Oh, here she is. Here's my oh. little friend. Come here. Come here, funny. Come on, come here. Come here. Now she won't listen. <laughs> That's big. Uh, 
but uh, let's see. So I was talking about I lost my train of thought. Well, when you, you were talking about, files? yeah, you're not you you don't record. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would send the these tracks out and reamp them through maybe a guitar amplifier or give them some kind of analog sound uh, by, by manipulating them here. I might re-record them, oh, um, you know, or bass uh, direct is easy to send out and put through another bass amp and record analog and then back in. So I might do some of that um, if, the, if the tracks are really kind of weak. But I, I record things. I, when I record, if I have the chance of recording, I want to record with all the effects on the tracks when I record them. I want to commit. Uh, this is a very important thing, I think, is, is know what you want and then go there all the way. Don't wait until the end of the mix before you're going to make it sound a certain way. Start with that sound, and then the, it's a lot easier to mix later when you've already done all the work ahead of time, you know? Yeah. So you prefer to, to be on every step of the, the, the song? I mean, like recording, producing, then mixing? It's yes, if I important can. Important yes. for you, yeah? Yeah, I think that it comes out the best that way. However, I'm okay with uh, someone else mixing. I gladly will take other files uh, to mix um Great. so it's okay either way but i do enjoy if especially if it's like a, a a music that i love um then i enjoy being a part of every every part of it and oftentimes i'll add my own flavor if the artist is okay with it i'll add backing vocals i'll put strings i'll add piano you know some things i will do on my own in the studio too, just to, to make it a better mix. Ah, great. And do you miss your vintage Niv? Yeah, oh, it's so, <laughs> it's, you had to ask that. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, no, 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 it's okay. You know, I, I had this console for 35 years. No, mm -hmm. not 35, it wasn't that long. It was maybe 25 years. I had this console, 1972, Vintage Neve, the best console. I can't tell you how great it was. Every time you put a microphone into it, it just sounded great, you know. Uh, but, it, and I bought it for a very, very low price. But uh, last year, it was, uh, I, I'm moving into a smaller place, rebuilding the studio in a much smaller space now. Uh, and we got this microphone museum. We bought it. And I thought to myself, I don't really need this big Neve anymore. You know, the, the, the Neve is very difficult to use. Um, and so I found a buyer who, who paid the top dollar for this vintage Neve. And uh, I was able to buy the Rupert Neve Designs console and a lot of other things and put a roof on the building. <laughs> uh, for the money that uh, I got from the Neve. So it was all worth it. Uh, sometimes I think about the Neve and I'm like, oh, but I'm okay. I've done recordings now. We got a replacement console at the other studio. We have another studio. We got a replacement console. It's a, uh, a Trident from the seven, wow. from 1980. It's a Trident, a 65. Very wow. good console. That's very good. Very right? good. <laughs> yeah. And it's not so expensive. But it also is a very good sound, and it's much easier to use. So I, I don't have to be there all the time. Engineers come in. They know exactly how it works. So it's okay. Uh, great. And is the process during a record making as important as the final results to you? If so, was, was that always the case in our career or something you've developed through the years? Uh, I always think that the process of recording is a very important in in establishing a sound for an album or a song. Um, that it, the joy of of the process can be heard in the recording. But uh, for that reason, then I might, you know, depending on the music, what the music is is uh, about. Let's say if it's about anger. 
well, I don't want it to all be happiness in the studio. I want people to feel this angry, you know, and you can hear it in the tracks. So a lot of times uh, uh, I might not be nice to the, the clients when I'm working with them. You know, it's, it sounds funny, but I might abuse the singer to make them angry uh, as a way to manipulate their, uh, their performance. Wow. It's, it's, a they, <laughs> it's a trick, too, of producing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, sometimes I'll just make the room very uncomfortable. I'll turn on all the lights. Uh, you know, they're, oh, you know, they have a hangover or whatever. This is making them upset. Good. Uh, then I'll uh, turn down the air conditioning so it's freezing in there, and then they're just like, eh. um, Or I'll make them go uh, stop singing and go run outside. Okay, you know, uh, go run around the block three times, come back here, and then we'll do it, do some more. And then when they come in, they're just like, ah! you know, they're very excited. So. That's so great to hear because we, when we are in studio, we are always doing the the, the opposite. Like, yeah, right, oh, like please, the candles we need to incense. please the artist to <laughs> no, sing well, no. nice and soft. But no. yeah. You're completely right. Yeah. Well, but sometimes, you know, and sometimes I'll even uh, go so far as to say, okay, here's a bottle of whiskey. You know, your song is about uh, being in jail and that you just came out of jail and you're, you're outside on the outside for the first time in 25 years. I, wanna, I want you to express this. So here's a bottle of whiskey. You just got out of jail. Okay, now sing the song, right? And so I, I give them... Uh, a character to to uh, become for the 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 song, and and this is something that is very interesting about uh, people who write songs. If they write their own song, it's usually with words that come from them, their heart. So I want them, as they're singing it, to think about why they wrote these words, what it was really about. And I want them to communicate that with me. Do not read the lyrics off a page. I want this to be from here. I want to feel the real emotion uh, that was uh, a part of the writing of this, the, these words. So it sometimes can be very uh, painful for people to give that type of performance. But, uh, but wow, it's very effective. when And you can really feel it. Uh, when you listen back to these performances, you can tell that there was true emotion behind it. Wow, that's very special. <laughs> Yesterday, yeah. I had a conversation with uh, Far From Alaska about yeah. you. <laughs> uh, they they are here watching us <laughs> and and send your uh, send to you kiss kiss. Okay, I love them so. Much. <laughs> and the singer uh, said that. You made her sing in a way she couldn't imagine it. Mm, yeah, and they're great singers. Uh, what have you wow. done? <laughs> uh, I love them so much. And uh, every, every musician in the band is, is extremely good. And together they make this sound that's just really like uh, edgy and uh, uh, angular. You know, it's just a, a very, very good uh, um, uh, really, really great musicians and, and a really good act. I love it. Yeah. And I, I was studying a, a lot about you <laughs> these days <laughs> to <laughs> prepare um, to this interview. And I, I watched a video with uh, Tony Hawkins. Uh, Tony oh, Hawkins. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the the yeah. drummer, Foo Fighters drummer? Yes, yes. With Antilope? Taylor. Until Taylor Hawkins, yeah. <laughs> yes, Taylor, yes. And uh, you used um, 40 mics, okay? All right? Yes, 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 yeah. And how A do lot you... of mics. Yes. Way too many mics. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you deal, deal with phase, phase relationship? Well, what I did is I, when I, when I typically record uh, a drum kit, I will use a set of mics, very simple mics. But what I do is I put a mic on the top and a mic on the bottom of each tom and of the snare drum. And then I flip the bottom out of phase so that the two mics are in phase. And then I record both of these mics onto one track. 
So I, I make the, the sum uh, while I'm recording and commit. Uh, Jesse, and yeah, no, yeah, no that's more, it. That, no more phase uh, correlation. Well, I, I correct it. I corrected it at the beginning. However, with this, the setup with all these extra microphones, what I did is I created two drum kits. So there was my standard drum kit uh, miking with these mics like this. And then there was a, an entirely different miking with all these weird old mics that I have in the museum. And so within there, at that group, uh, I was careful to watch for phase problems within that group. But the initial uh, normal miking was already sorted out with phase two. Now, having all of it open and together in, in a, a mix, there's going to be some problems. But I, I pull out the ones that don't work, uh, the mics that have the most problems. And, uh, and everything is fine. Boy, we got really good drum sounds yes. with all those microphones. And it was really, maybe we didn't use all those microphones in the mix. Maybe not even a fraction. Um, but the ones that worked, we used. Uh, I had Taylor actually wearing a watch uh -huh. that was a spy watch that yeah. had a microphone <laughs> built in. And he was playing the drums with this watch. And it, and it was actually a really good sound. We oh, used yeah. it in the final mix. Um, so you never know which one's going to work and which one's not. But I always put up extra mics just in case they might or might not work. But I won't open everything because you're right. This phase, the phase, uh, phase problems make everything sound thin and papery. And where oh, does this inspiration up. come from to try things, to uh, this experimentation? Ah, I don't know. It's a, it's just a natural uh, thing for me is to experiment. But I like the idea of making the most outrageous sounds. What is the, you know, like there's a movie, uh, Dumb and Dumber, <laughs> right? Dumb, you know this movie? Yes, right? yes. Right? Right? And, and uh, Jim Carrey says, uh, you want to hear the world's most obnoxious sound? And then he goes, eh, it's just a horrible sound. Well, I like this idea of let's get in the studio, let's make the most a uh, disgusting sound or the most outrageous or the the you know the most outrageous sound that we could have and that's where i started with uh you know with tool and when i was working with the band tool and i thought well what is the biggest most outrageous sound we could make and i thought well if we had a crane and we picked up a piano and dropped it that would be a big obnoxious big sound we could put on this record And so I started trying to find a crane that I could lift piano with. And I, no one, I could not find anyone who was willing to do that with their crane. So we did get pianos. And instead of dropping it with a crane, we got a shotgun. And then we got sledgehammers. And, <laughs> and I recorded uh, the, the, you know, I put uh, microphones on the pianos. And then we recorded smashing and destroying these pianos. It was a cacophony. It was a fantastic sound. Uh, and then we made a piece of music using these sounds in a sequence, and it's called Disgustipated. And that's at the end of Undertow. It's uh, all the sounds from destroying these pianos. So every, every session, I try to bring in some kind of experimentation or some kind of reward for hard work done is that, okay, we're going to take a, a field trip and we're going to go record in a cave or we're going to go on a boat, we're going to record on a boat or, you know, some any kind of thing uh, that uh, is fun and adventurous and has the potential of being great or maybe of completely failing, you know, <laughs> failure, failure, you know, you have to be able to accept the failure. But the, the trick is to not waste time on doing experiments, make sure that the important work is done first, and then you can goof off and maybe make mistakes. It's okay. Can you tell us about uh, when you recorded uh, in the London subway? Oh, yeah, yeah. And let, Just let tell us something. Uh, yeah. Okay. I want to show you this uh, recorder that I used, and uh, I'll just put the mic down for a second and grab this thing. I'll, I'll right back. Okay, okay. Deixa eu ver se tá tudo bem aqui no chat. Eu tô um pouco mais calma agora. Minha mão já está normal. 
All right, let me put the lavalier back on here. Here we are. So this, the, this band that I was working with in London, they're called Goddamn. And the, the, the band is very um, aggressive and very noisy. Everything is distorted and ridiculous, right? And the singer, it was so fun working with this, uh, these guys because they, they said uh, they wanted to have the most disgusting sound ever. So how do you make disgusting? Well, it's like uh, you turn everything up to 11 and you... <laughs> And, uh, and you use uh, alternate microphones. Uh, and then, then on the very end of the session, we went to the, the London Underground to an abandoned London subway station and we recorded. And I used this. This is a, a device that I use when I record outside of the studio. And it's called a Mix Pre 10. It's made by a company called Sound Devices. And it has... Uh, mic pre's it has eight mic pre's for eight microphones that you can record at the same time e each mic has its own level uh there's phantom power and it's battery operated and it's a standalone so the tracks and everything uh, is is all built in um but you can use this also as an interface for pro tools but you don't have to. You don't have to have a laptop or anything else. You can wow. carry just this and do multi-track recording with just this. It's fantastic. I've taken it all over the world and recorded with it. It's fantastic. So wow. um, we went into the subway uh, and we had only one hour to record because they charged us $1,000 an hour. So we only had one hour budget. <laughs> <laughs> and so we... We grabbed all the equipment and the drums and the guitar and, and the microphones and we ran down the stairs. There was no elevator to get down to this thing. The, the, it was way underground, like many, like 400 steps to get down there on this circular staircase. And we ran and ran and ran. And then there were two uh, platforms. Uh, one was uh, for guitar and one was for drums. Uh, you know, there was a dead subway train on one of the platforms. And it was just very strange and wonderful. Uh, and the sound was amazing. Uh, so you never know what you're going to get. And you never know if it's going to work. Luckily, we did uh, get a great recording in, in, um, in the subway. And I used it. I transferred the files, the digital files, into Pro Tools. And I used them in the final mix. It was great. I mean, it's a... The, the reverb, natural uh, reverb, was tremendous. Oh. So that worked out. And yeah. the band, Goddamn, also, uh, we mixed it, um, and it came out so good. But we actually did vocals in unconventional ways, too. And this was uh, like, let me see if I can grab this under here. But one of the techniques that we used for vocals to get the most disgusting vocal possible is we used headphones as a microphone. And how we did it, it was, uh, let me undo these headphones here, but it was having the singer sing into an earphone uh -huh. from, uh, from here. So he was singing like this, oh! <laughs> into, <laughs> <laughs> I just get tickled thinking about it, but this was plugged into a guitar pedal, and then that guitar pedal was going into an amp, and then I mic'd the amp, and so the the vocals were extremely distorted and awesome. Just so, you, you know, did you know that you could use headphones as a microphone? Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, you did. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, Sylvia, I want yeah. to know um, how do you positioning your overheads? Is ah. always the same time or? Yeah, you know, some people they say, you know, your snare drum is right here, so you have to have equal distance. Ah. I don't do that. I, with the overheads, I'm recording cymbals. So if, if you have a drum kit and some cymbals over here are this high and then some cymbals over here are this low, I'll, I'll make the mics so they match 
you know, where the where the symbols are. Uh, I like to put a, a large diaphragm condenser over each group of symbols. So that's typically how I record. I don't. I want to be careful that they're not uh, uh, creating phase problems with each other. So I'll, I'll I'll generally angle them a little bit out like this. But um, typically, I am concentrating on capturing symbols and not worried about where the snare is in the picture. That's just me, though. There's different ways of doing it. Ah, great. <laughs> <laughs> Hafa, do you have some question? Another question? Um, I would like to know a little bit more oh, no, about... No, no. Um, um, Val, Val Santos from Toy... Oh, my God. Yes. Toy shop. Yes, toy shop. Yes. yes. <laughs> he's waiting. He's watching us. Oh, that's so great. <laughs> yeah, those guys are wonderful. I love them. And then uh, I miss them. I miss them a lot. Do, do, ha, uh, have you ever been in Brazil? No, I have not. I've been to uh, Argentina. Uh -huh. but not to Brazil. So I have to come to Brazil and I can't wait for everybody to be healthy enough that we can start traveling again and I'll yes. come visit. Yes. <laughs> Great. Um, Rafa, a final question? Oh. Okay, final question. Um, I, I love, we love uh, the way you do your unusual uh, recording and you have so many different gears like that watch you were telling us about. And I would like to know if you build them, if you build oh, gear, yeah. uh, you told us about your dad, maybe yeah. your relation with electronic engineering. Uh, you know, having grown up in a household where the my father was building electronics made me very unafraid to do these things. Uh, so, he actually taught me how to do certain things um, uh, like, for instance, and I'm looking around for uh, what I could show you. I know I have one somewhere. But anyway, I take I take telephones. This is my father taught me this. I take an old telephone, like a dial telephone, old style. And then you take the, the mouthpiece off, and there's a microphone in the mouthpiece of a, a regular telephone. Well, you can take the handset and put an XLR connector on it and turn it into a mic that you can use in, uh, in sessions. You know, it's a line level mic, and all you do is you take an XLR, cut it off, cut it in half, and then wire it into that mouthpiece. Uh, and then, but on one side of the mouthpiece, Uh, of the of the wiring, you put a uh, a uh, battery, 1.5 volt battery, and boy, this the TV's got a light <laughs> on my face. I see the t giant TV. I don't know where the clicker is, I, <laughs> but anyway. So uh, the the, uh, uh, the so you can turn the your telephone into a microphone, and uh, so that was like one of the first things that my father taught me that I could use in the studio. And because of that, it was it, it became easy for me to try different things. And I started to experiment with uh, using um, different things as filters. Uh, and this was not, this was beyond what my father was showing me, but I would come and show him, hey, dad, look what I did this time, you know. Yeah. Um, but he would enjoy it. He, he passed away last year and I miss him. But, um, but yeah, I learned a lot from him. So there was a... Um, a way to take audio and run it into an amplifier, a solid state amplifier, and take the output, uh, the speaker output of that amplifier. And, and typically it would go into a speaker, right? With a speaker cable. Well, you cut that speaker cable and now you insert different things in, into that cable that will filter and affect the sound. So the first, the first experiment I did was with a potato because we were joking around in the session and, and we're like, hey, what, what, does it, what does a potato sound like? Oh, let's find out, right? So it was, a, it was kind of a joke. And then we tried it and it worked, you know? It's like, <laughs> ah. 
And the, the sound of a potato is a nice high shelf on high frequency, you know, but, but a lot of attenuation. So then we tried different things. I tried hot dogs. Hot dogs <laughs> di sound different and they're very flat, you know. Uh, then I tried uh, cheese sausage and all of a sudden it was like, oh my God, this is a good sound. This is a very good blues tone for guitar. So we thought, well, what's the difference between a hot dog and a cheese sausage? Well, it's the cheese, right? So we just took a chunk of cheese, put the audio through the cheese, and oh my God, this is a great sound. If, you, if you're looking for something that is better than any pedal for overdrive, uh, just try running it through cheese. <laughs> I'll try on a gorgonzola. <laughs> It's ridiculous, but oh my God, it's so much fun. And, uh, and when you start doing these kind of experiments, people, they, they light up, you know, and then their mind starts working too. And then they come up with more ideas and more ideas. And so usually at that point in the session, there's no going back after that. You know, we start into uh, the experimentation and then uh, it's hard to settle down and, and to do things seriously again. So I usually save experimentation for the last days of recording so that we can really have fun with it and not affect um, the final uh, recording uh, by uh, by short changing time on important things so yeah I mean it, 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 it should be an adventure I think recording should be an adventure because you can hear it in those tracks and the uh, 111c transformer was ah, yeah. an experimentation I too yeah, and let me show you yeah. how I have it set up here. Uh, I have a 111C just to let you know what a 111C is. And I'm going to move over to this camera. Hello. Hello. So over here on the floor, you can see um, I have a few things that I use on my stereo bus. Uh, so the, the stereo bus runs through these analog units, and this is uh, – a pair of 111C transformers. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up here so you can see it better because it's hard to see um, on the floor. But here, let me just grab it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, here we go. Hey, there goes my mic again. Too. Dang it! Your wireless mic. Here we go. Back on my mic keeps falling off. Sorry about that. <laughs> Any no problem? Okay, there we go. All right. Yes. This so this right here. This is uh, I think it's from the 1930s, maybe maybe newer, maybe the 50s, but this is a pair of Western Electric 111C transformers. And it was a, a friend of mine, um, Ross Hogarth, who told me about this technique where you can take your mix, uh, and maybe it's a digital mix, it might be thin sounding, you put that audio, you go D to A, so it's back to analog, run it through these uh, old transformers, and then back into digital and record it you know, the, the kind of the sound that you get from these transformers gives the, the mix a kind of a furry uh, uh, metal iron sound, iron. Uh, and that's what it is. It's, these are passive. There's no power going into them. They're old audio transformers from a telephone system. And, uh, and they just... Depending on how you wire the top, um, you can get different effects. You can make it a lot more saturated sounding by how you wire it. Um, and it's fun. And it's not dangerous at all. Some of the experiments that I do are dangerous, like <laughs> using the, you know, putting the potatoes in the out, output of a Pickles. amplifier. That can be dangerous. So you have to be very careful. When you do these experiments, always be careful not to to have anything plugged into a wall while you're setting it up. You can plug in the amplifier after everything is all set up and then you, you'll be safe. But this kind of thing, there's, there's no danger in that. 
Yeah. It's nice, huh? <laughs> Great. Um, yeah. I, I have two more, one question or two. Um, yeah. To, to finish. <laughs> How do you normally start your mix? Ah, oh, this is so important. It's so, so important. So let me see if I can give you my my uh, screen here. Uh, okay. <laughs> I've got uh, my mix screen here. And this is a session from, um, from Taylor Hawkins. Uh -huh. But let's say I'm setting up my first song in a mix. My first uh, song then... I, I create a session and I input um, uh, and, I, and I import all my wave files into the session. And the first thing I do before I do anything is I take every single track and I bring it down minus 15. And this is so important. And, uh, you know, some people think, well, aren't you reducing your bit depth by bringing it down? Well, my understanding from doing research is that there's so much bit depth that this does not affect um, the the quality, the the the, uh, the uh, resolution of the sound. So I bring every track down minus 15 before I start, and that that allows me so much headroom. Uh, when I started doing that, my mix is just opened up because there's a kind of a claustrophobia from digital mixing where everything is pinched sounding and it just is kind of a, abrasive, you know, it doesn't sound good. But when you start with very, very low levels and then let everything kind of creep up a little bit at a time, it makes a huge difference in the final, uh, uh, in, in how you can have an open sounding and dynamic mix, you know. So I suggest that you ask such a good question and how do you start a mix? And that's exactly how I start a mix every time. Oh, that's so good to hear. I do the same. You do? See, yeah, minus no, 15. Yeah, same no number. one teaches us this stuff. Nobody is teaching no. this. Yes. Yeah, so we have to experiment because I was wondering, why, why am I having this problem? Is everyone else also having yes. this problem? Yes. <laughs> They are, yes. Everyone's having the same problem. And you solo the drums? Do you solo the drums or it's all, all of, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's solo, uh, uh, all Portuguese. playing at the same time or you you go to, to the instruments, specific instruments? Oh, well, I take everything, e everything, vocals, guitar, everything comes into the session imported at the same time. I bring everything down, mm -hmm. then I separate each instrument, and then I have a template that I work from. The template is extremely important for me, and, and I'll go back to my screen here, and you can see uh, I start at the very top of the session. This is the top of the session, and these are drums. Uh, all the drums come together, uh, and then I have... Um, the just a, a sum for only drums and then here's the second drum kit that I don't use this is should be muted actually uh, and then we have other instruments like bass okay bass has its own sum here's the sum on that bass uh, each instrument has its own sum and that way it has its own effects that are only for that instrument And that way, I also have control over uh, uh, the levels for each instrument, the effects for each instrument. And uh, it's much easier to do stems later uh, when it's time to uh, finish a mix. So, yeah, this is, this is a, a very important thing, I think, uh, is, is to use the, um, the template. And it took years for me to develop this template. I'm always improving the template. The template holds all the reverbs and EQ and any other uh, uh, type of processing that I'll do. So I just, I, I, first I import the tracks, I bring down all the levels, then I import my template and I put each category into the template and then pretty much it's almost mixed. And I'd love to at some point 
if we want to get together again and talk about mixing in particular, I'll, I'll demonstrate how to take a, a, the mix from the beginning and uh, put it into the template and then bam, 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 bam. We're, we're very close to being finished with the mix very quickly by using templates and using this technique. So wow. anyway, that's a whole other uh, yeah. time <laughs> that we could spend yes. together. And yeah. you, are you write, re, writing a book, a new book, right? Yes, there's a book. There's two books. Uh, um, I wrote a book with Chris. Chris and I wrote a book uh, maybe five years ago. Uh, called Recording Unhinged, and it did very well. So our publisher asked us to write another book uh, for Recording Unhinged Part Two. Uh, and then we recently purchased a, a microphone museum, which is just nuts. Uh, and I, I'm going to show you just a little bit of this because it's just crazy. All right. Yes, so yes. let me just, <laughs> it's so nutty. And I'm going to turn on this uh, this here. Here we go. There, now you can see, right? This is wow. some of the microphones in the microphone wow. museum. Uh, there's so many microphones. And then I've got all this gear here too uh, from the museum. And you can see it's all old um, broadcast equipment and stuff. Anyway, so we, we bought the, uh, the mic museum while we were writing a book about microphones and so we're we're also writing a book about the 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 number it will be the 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 best book for vintage microphones that you can get and it'll be like an encyclopedia also with stories about how to use these mics uh the history of some companies and things it'll be a very interesting book and i think we'll re we'll feature 600 of um the world's greatest Uh, microphones wow. in, in this book. So yeah, we have That's a couple cool. books underways, and it's going to be so good. You're going to love the microphone book. It's going to be. Are you going to be drawing it uh, as well? Yeah. I'll draw some things in there too. Yes, cool. I, I'm going to, I love to draw. You know. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Sylvia, uh, one hour of <laughs> talk uh, <laughs> was great. It's been fantastic. Yes, yes. We have to get together ourselves. Everybody, yes. we, we need to just get together. You come up here, I come on down there. We meet somewhere in Europe or something. Let's do it. Don't ask <laughs> <Australia>. twice. <laughs> I'm already there. Awesome. Awesome. I, well, I can't wait to visit Brazil. Never been, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, thank oh. you a lot for your time, for your... Uh, I know. I don't know. I, 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 I don't have enough words to thank you. <laughs> ah, it was and awesome. I had again. a okay. great, great time. I hope you had too. As, yes. Yeah. Good. And I, I, I'm nervous and, until now, but <laughs> ah, <laughs> was good. And yeah. the people on the chat like it too. Please oh, um, write some hearts, some love to Sylvia <laughs> 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 on the chat. Uh, thank you. Thank you for yes. being you guys your, are great. our reference. Appreciate it. Yes. Thank you very much. And, uh, and be um, so, uh, a person who loves the, your job and you always... Uh, have a smile on the face. Uh, I can't help it. <laughs> I mean, we get to do this. This is what we do. We're the luckiest people in the world, right? Yeah. You're right. Uh, so thank you, Sylvia. People, uh, don't forget to hit the like button down below. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> my English is <laughs> progress. You did great. And that's it for now. Okay. Bye bye, guys. I hope bye. you like it. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks, Chris. Sure. <laughs> Yay. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.